Who is Jesus? Since his life on earth over 2,000 years ago, he's become the most famous man in history. His life, what he did and said, was recorded by his best friend John. John's purpose for writing about Jesus was that you may believe he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Well, thanks for being with us today, church. Uh, Who is Jesus? That was awkward. Uh, <laughs> my name is Bubba. I'm one of the pastors. It's my joy to spend some time with you in the Bible. And we are in our series called Life with Jesus. Uh, we're in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1, looking at verses 19 through 34. That's where we are today. And uh, for those of you who are here in the room, uh, you'll notice our projector screen is out. And I just want to acknowledge this. It broke this last week. And so... Um, we're in the process of getting it fixed. They're telling us it's going to be like six to eight weeks before we can get it fixed. So sorry, but for about six to eight weeks, it's, not, it's going to be broken. Uh, and the reason is simple. We're not going to spend uh, thousands of dollars to rent one. We'll just get the one that's broken fixed. Okay, so I hope you can appreciate it. When you look at that screen, just think we're being faithful stewards. Uh, <laughs> And so uh, we're in this series, and the goal of this series as, is for us is really to uh, personally connect with Jesus, right? That's what we're wanting, to personally connect with Jesus. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for us in our time together, and then we're going to just jump right in and see what God would have for us today. So let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your grace and mercy and love. You are so good to us, so good to us. Uh, you, you, you bless us over and over and over again. You give us mercy and grace. You give us yourself. Uh, and I just am overwhelmed with the gift of uh, your son, Jesus. Uh, Jesus, we just take a moment to give you praise and honor and glory, to, to, to acknowledge you're the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the son of God. Uh, we thank you for living without sin, dying for our sin, rising from the grave. We are uh, in awe of you, Jesus. And I do pray and I ask, uh, Holy Spirit, as we open up your word today, uh, speak to us. May we hear from you. May you build us up in faith. Uh, for those who maybe are struggling with uh, doubt, uh, maybe a little skepticism, uncertainty, uh, I pray, God, today would you give them reassurance. I pray and ask, uh, would you build them up in faith? And for especially those who are going to hear this message, Lord, and don't know you or um, are, are not sure whether or not they believe in Jesus. I pray, God, uh, that you would give them faith and that indeed they would have a relationship with Jesus. And so, God, we're praying for just a movement of your spirit. Help us to be a people who are able to trust you and depend on you in all of life. We pray this in Jesus' good name. Amen. Doubt, right? Doubt. It is a uh, real problem, doubt. I don't know if it's something that you've ever, you've ever struggled with. I, I've struggled with doubt. And uh, I want to ask you this question. Have you, have you ever known someone who is 100% certain 100% of the time? Have you ever met that person? Have you ever met someone who has never, not once, not, a, not even for, not, not, not once struggled with doubt? Um, I, for one, have never met someone who is 100% certain 100% of the time. I've never met someone who's never struggled with doubt. It seems to me that we all have moments of doubt. And different people doubt in different ways, right? Some people doubt themselves, their, uh, their ability, their identity, their self-worth. Uh, some people doubt others, uh, whether or not people can be trusted or if they're reliable or dependable. Uh, some people, though, they doubt God. Some people doubt whether or not God exists. Some people doubt whether or not God cares about them. Some people doubt whether or not they can uh, depend on God and if they should really live their life for God. And so at different times and different ways, different people doubt. And if you've ever struggled with doubt, 
then you've probably been in a place where you've, you've needed something, right? Like, what do we need when we struggle with doubt? It seems to me what we need is we need reassurance. That's what we need, reassurance. And uh, reassurance is kind of that, 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 that confidence to help you in that moment of doubt, to be able to, 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 to give you reasons to believe. Now, God is good to us. God gives us reassurance, and he, he does that in a particular unique and special way. Uh, and indeed, there's actually a lot of different ways he does that, but there's one in particular way we're going to be looking at today, and, and that is uh, the reassurance that can come through an eyewitness account, an eyewitness testimony, right? Because when you doubt, you need reassurance, and an eyewitness is someone who has seen the truth firsthand. They've seen it themselves, so they can tell you what they've seen, which then gives you the assurance that you need for what is true, and then that helps you to have faith or believe in your own doubt. And as we look at the section of Scripture we're looking at today, uh, it, it's an interesting section of Scripture because in it we see a number of witnesses. There are actually three different witnesses we're going to look at, uh, and, and these witnesses are going to give us some reassurance. Because ultimately, we're really asking the question, like, who is Jesus? And in order for us to know who he is, we not only need to be told, but we need at times to be reassured. And so let's just jump into this. Uh, the first uh, witness we're going to look at is John's witness, right? John's witness. We see this in verses 29 through 31. It says, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Now, here, what's happening in these verses is the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, is speaking about a guy named John, uh, John the Baptizer. And so don't let that, conf that confuse you. It's, it's actually kind of interesting because um, throughout the Gospel of John, every time the name John is mentioned, it's never talking about John the Apostle. Uh, in fact, it's, it's almost every time it's like talking about John the baptizer. When John the apostle speaks about himself, which he only does like three or four times, it's pretty rare for him to do that. He always refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. But he never mentions himself by his name, uh, which kind of makes sense, right? You wouldn't tell a story about yourself by listing your own name. That would just be weird, right? <laughs> Um, and, and we know that this is talking about John the, the baptizer because when we look at verse 19, it starts to make this really clear to us. It says, um, you know, this is uh, the testimony of John, right? John the baptizer. In, in the days of Jesus, John the baptizer had a really uh, important, very influential ministry. What he was doing is he was actually uh, in the wilderness preaching repentance, calling people to, to repent of their sins, and then he was baptizing people. And uh, normally what would happen is someone, if they were like a, you know, a Jewish preacher, which John was Jewish, if they were a Jewish preacher, they would be preaching to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, and telling them to repent of their sins and be baptized so that they could convert to Judaism. But that's actually not what John is doing. John is actually preaching to the Jews and telling them to repent of their sins and be baptized and that was really bizarre. It was not, it wasn't normal. They didn't really do that. And he was doing that because he was wanting them to prepare themselves for the Christ. He wanted them to be cleansed to prepare themselves for the Christ. So what happens is John is, he's in the wilderness, he's ministering, thousands of people are coming to him. And obviously this causes uh, some, some curiosity among the religious leaders. And so the religious leaders want to know, what's up? What's up, John? And so look what they do as we continue here in the rest of verse 19. It says, when the Jews, that's talking about the religious leaders, um, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, uh, who are you? So ultimately the religious leaders, they're like, John, we want to know who you are because we're a little concerned about what you're doing. Who are you? Um, and, 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 and he... Um, 
He confessed to them, verse 20, right? He confessed and he did not deny but confessed. He says, I'm not the Christ. So they're like, John, are you the Christ? He's like, no, I'm not the Christ. And so then they're like, okay, uh, verse 21. Then they asked him, then who? Uh, you know, what, what then? Are, 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 you, um, are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. They said to him, uh, who are you? You need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Right? The religious leaders want to know, John, what gives you the authority to do this stuff? What is he going to say? Look what he says. Verse 23, he said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the, the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees, and they asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one uh, you do not know, even he who comes after me, the straps of whose sandal I am unworthy to untie. These things took place in Beth Bethany across from the Jordan where John was baptizing. So what we see here is that John is saying, look, my job is to prepare all the people for the Christ, for the Messiah. That's my job. He's, he's actually the forerunner whom uh, the prophet Isaiah prophesied about. That's what he says. That's what he tells them. And so he's just simply trying to get the people ready for Jesus. Now, what does he say about Jesus? Look what he says. If we go back to verse 29, he says, uh, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All right, so you have to kind of imagine the scene Right? John's standing there. There's these people asking him, like, who are you? Why are you doing what you're doing? Uh, he's already mentioned to them, there's one among you that you don't know. I'm not even worthy to, like, you know, untie his sandals. Like, this guy, he, he's something else. And then as Jesus, like, walks up, he's like, behold, right, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what's happening here in this moment. Um, you know, when, when we see this, this, this kind of statement, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, most Christians, they think John is talking about, like, the cross. They think, well, he must be referring to the, the, the cross, that Jesus is going to die on the cross for our sins. That must be what he's talking about. But it, it, it's not actually what he's talking about, right? Think about the context. Think about the moment that's happening here in history, right? Jesus um, his, 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 is just beginning his public ministry. He hasn't even started, he hasn't really started preaching yet or teaching. That hasn't happened. He hasn't started gathering people to himself. He hasn't started doing miracles. None of that has taken place. Uh, Jesus, he, 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 uh, he's going to have years of ministry before the cross happens. Nobody even is thinking about something like that. J John the baptizer is not thinking about the cross. Uh, he's not aware of that at all. And rather, he's thinking about what the Old Testament scriptures say about the Messiah, the Christ. And so um, what is he really referring to here? If, if we want to understand like his understanding of the Christ, uh, it's helpful to look at some other places in scripture. In, in fact, Matthew chapter 3, uh, which recalls this same kind of encounter, the same story, it gives us a little bit more of a a window, a picture into what John is thinking. Look, look what it says. Um, it says, this is John speaking, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, now here's where we start to see really his, his understanding of the Christ. He says, his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. It's pretty intense, is it not? Um, it, it seems that his understanding of the Christ has more to do with uh, judgment than, than, than being some kind of atoning sacrifice. And, and you have to understand that would have actually been very common in John's day. Um, it was very common for there to be this kind of like, you know, um, apocalyptic warrior imagery of the Lamb of God, that he was going to come back and he was going to make everything right. 
And it seems that that's the kind of idea that John has of who the Messiah is going to be, that that's what he's going to be about. Now, when we think of the phrase, you know, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, we obviously see that it has more meaning than that. We, we see it in its kind of double meaning. We think, okay, uh, for us, because of where we are in history, we look back and go, well, obviously that's pointing towards the cross because Jesus at the cross makes atonement for our sins. But it also, though, is pointing to something happening in the future that hasn't happened yet where Jesus is going to return. He's going to return and he's going to make everything that's gone wrong right. No more sin or suffering or death. He's going to make all things new. And so he atones for sin on the cross and there will come a day when sin will be no more because Jesus will make all things new. So we see that phrase and we understand that it has double meaning. But for John, John is simply, he's, he's simply seeing Jesus and proclaiming. Basically, he's saying, look, he's the Christ. That's what he's saying. Uh, but that's not all that he says about Jesus. Look what else he says. We look at verse 30. He says, uh, this is he, speaking of Jesus, of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. That might sound a little bit familiar. If you were with us last week, uh, we actually covered this statement last week. And uh, it talked a little bit about what it says. What John is referring to here when he says he, you know, he comes before me, he's not talking about Jesus' uh, age, right? Because John was born before Jesus. He's not talking about Jesus' ministry because John's ministry started before Jesus'. Uh, rather, what he's doing here is he's alluding to the fact that the Christ is eternal, he, he's, he's alluding to the eternality of Jesus. In essence, what he's saying is he's saying Jesus is the Christ. He's the eternal son of God. That's what he's doing here. And, and, and here's the point I want you to see. John is a witness. He's a witness who he's announcing. He's announcing publicly that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. Now, you, you may ask, like, okay, but uh, why should we believe him? Like, you know, like, why should we take this guy's, you know, his word? Uh, why should we take it to heart? Think about John for a moment, okay? John was, he was uh, set apart from birth, right? When he was, when he was uh, in his mother's womb, God kind of said, I'm, I want this guy to be a prophet. He's going to be someone who's going to speak truth. And so John was... He was set apart by God to be the forerunner of the Christ even before he was, uh, he, he was born. He spent his whole life preparing for that ministry. He spent his whole life serving God. He was a godly man. He was a man of character and integrity. As well, he even, uh, he even dies serving God. He's not someone who is trying to build a, a name for himself. In fact, what he does is he tries to point people to Jesus. And so he has no selfish motive or intention um, in being a witness. Rather, he, 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 he's just trying to get, help everybody see who Jesus is for who Jesus is. And, and you know, he, he's someone who is reliable. He's a reliable witness. And because of that, we can, we can, we can trust what he says. But he's not the only witness. Uh, in, in fact, we're going to hear from another witness. And so uh, the second witness we see, number two, is the Spirit's witness. Right? The Spirit's witness. We see uh, this in verse 32. It says, And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. All right? So, so now John is witnessing about the Spirit's witness of Jesus. And, and you may be going like, well, what's going on here? Like, what is this referring to? And he says he saw the spirit descend uh, like a dove and remain on him. This is actually what John is talking about here. He's talking about the baptism of Jesus. That's what he's talking about. And, you know, all, all four gospels mention the baptism of Jesus. Some of them talk about it in more detail than others. And if we want to really understand this a little bit further, if we look at Matthew chapter 3, uh, verses 13 through 17, we see a little bit more detail about what John is, is talking about. He, he says this, he says, or rather it says this, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. 
And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. So what we see here is this this baptism of Jesus, and as it's happening, the, the Spirit descends upon him, the Father speaks. That's what happens in this moment. And I want you to notice the precision of John's, his words. If we look back at the verse we were looking at a minute ago, uh, in verse 32, he says, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. Okay, so John here is describing what he actually saw with his own eyes. That, that as Je- so imagine this, okay, Jesus is there. John baptizes him, he comes up out of the water, and then as that happens, the Spirit of God comes down from heaven and rests on Jesus. But it happens in such a way to where John is able to actually see what's happening in that moment. Now, it doesn't say that the Spirit of God became a dove, so it's not as though the Spirit of God somehow transformed into an actual dove and flew down on Jesus. That didn't happen. It, but John here is trying to describe what he saw, and he's just like, well, it's hard for me to explain it. It kind of looked like how a dove would float down or something like that, right? But, but, but what I want you to understand is that he witnessed the Spirit descending on Jesus, and this is very, very important. Why did the Spirit rest on Jesus? The Spirit descends on Jesus, and in the Spirit descending on Jesus, what the Spirit is doing is the Spirit is testifying that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's what's happening in this moment. Right? In that moment, the Spirit is, is, giving, is giving witness about Jesus. Now, now interestingly, this isn't the first time that Jesus has experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit. If you look throughout Scripture, what you see is that it was a miracle of the Holy Spirit that caused the Virgin Mary to conceive. When, when God the Son added humanity to his divinity and was conceived, born as a human baby, in that moment of conception, that's a miracle of God the Holy Spirit. Where, uh, and in that moment, the Spirit of God is present with the child of God in the womb. And so Jesus is, has the presence of the Spirit from conception and from birth. He's always, he's always got the, the Spirit present with him. But there is a special anointing that's happening in this baptism. This special moment where the Spirit descends and comes upon him. And the reason for that is because the Spirit is giving witness, giving testimony that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Right, so here's the point, right? The Spirit testifies. The Spirit testifies that Jesus is the Son of God. You could say, well, why should we trust the Spirit? Uh, well, the Holy Spirit is God. Right? The Bible says there's one God, three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. God never lies. God never sins. The Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of truth, the one who guides us into the truth. The Holy Spirit is reliable, a reliable witness that we can and should trust. But the Holy Spirit is not the only witness we're given. In fact, we're given another witness, which leads to the third witness we see, number three, and that is the Father's witness, right? The Father's witness. Uh, We see this in verse 33. John continues, he says, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, now, now notice what John is saying here. He's saying, look, he says, uh, he who sent me, he said to me. So so what is he doing? He's he's telling us about what was said to him. Who sent him? Who spoke to him? God the Father. So, So again, John is saying, this is what the Father's witness, this is the Father's testimony. Right? God the Father told me that, um, that there would be uh, you know, this moment when the Spirit would descend on the Christ, and that would be confirmation and affirmation of who the Christ is. So, so think about this moment for a moment. Um, 
you know, here's John, he's baptizing Jesus, he brings him up out of the water, the Spirit of God descends upon him, and at that moment, right, Matthew told us, the heavens open up, and there's a voice from heaven that says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. And so what you see in this moment of Jesus' baptism is, um, you know, the, the Spirit testifying that he's the Son of God, and even God the Father himself speaking, this is the Son, this is my Son, look at him, look at him. And John is able to, 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 to see this and witness this, and he didn't know 100% like who the Christ was until that moment happened. Right? When, when that moment happened, it was uh, confirmation, it was affirmation, right? So the Father here gives witness, right? The Father gives witness that Jesus is the Son of God. And if you were to say, well, how can we trust the Father? Again, God the Father is God. He never sins. He never lies. He always speaks truth. His character is perfect. There's no one more reliable than God. And so, 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 so notice what is happening here. Even John, I'm sure, could have questioned his own ability to discern the Christ, but he was given the witness of the Spirit and the witness of the Father, which made him come to a conclusion himself. And we see his own conclusion in uh, verse 34. He says, I have seen and bore witness that this is the Son of God. So John's able to say, look, because of what happened, the Father told me to baptize and he would send the Spirit. And indeed, I baptized, and then Jesus received the Spirit, and then the Father spoke, and all these things that happened, John's saying, I know for certain Jesus is the Son of God because of what took place. And because of John's witness and his certainty, we can also have assurance that Jesus is the Son of God. Right? Here's what I want you to understand, friends. The Christian faith is not a blind faith, meaning we're not asked to believe in something without any reason or evidence. Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But that does not mean that faith is blind and mindless. Rather, what it means is that we, we need to have conviction, right, confidence in things that we maybe personally haven't seen, and yet there can be evidence to give us that conviction, that confidence, right? This is, this is why throughout the scriptures you see all kinds of eyewitness testimony. That's one of the forms of evidence that we receive that can help us to have confirmation, conviction of our faith. Right? I mean, we, 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 we trust eyewitness testimony even today, even today. If you think about like a, a court system, if someone were in court and they want to find out like what is actually true, what actually happened, what do they do? They, they call forth witnesses and then witnesses are able to give an account. And, you know, the witness comes up and says, well, this is what I saw and this is what happened. Okay, great. They write it down. They're taking it down. And then someone else comes up, another witness. Well, this is what I saw and this is what happened. And if you get a number of witnesses who are all speaking about the same situation, the same moment, though they may describe it in slightly different ways, may they, they may emphasize the details a little bit differently by having, a, 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 you know, a plethora of witnesses, you're able to then bring all that data together and say, this gives us a pretty accurate picture of what really happened, what took place. And we look at eyewitness account and testimony, and we take that to heart, and we say, this helps us to understand truth. All right, so we do this as a culture, as a society, even within our own legal system, we do this. And the reason that it we do this is because it's actually reliable. And the scriptures have this approach as well, right? There are many accounts of Jesus and who he is and what he did. And though 
you know, the Gospels themselves are accounts, right? You've got these different accounts of the life of Jesus, and though they may describe moments or events in slightly different ways, by looking at the different accounts, we get to see an accurate picture or portrayal of what actually took place. The reason that's important is because that gives us the confidence, the evidence that we need for faith. Right? So, so this is how it plays out like in my life, right? Like, like I wasn't there when Jesus got baptized. Surprise, right? <laughs> but I can trust the eyewitness testimony of those who were. Right? The, 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 I, I can look at the, the gospel stories and see, this, you know, John is testifying, the Spirit is testifying, the Father is testifying. There, there are different different testimonies happening, and I can look at them and I can say, though I didn't actually see it with my own eyes, I can trust that it happened. And that gives me assurance. It gives me faith. It, it, it helps me to be able to believe. All right, now, in, in saying that, right, in saying that, I, I suspect some of you, you know, you may still say, yeah, but I struggle with doubt. And, you know, um, what do I do, like, when that's happening? I want, to, I want to talk for a moment just about, like, doubt and skepticism, right? Because we live in a day, that, a day of skepticism, right? In our culture, our society, there's so much skepticism. And, and, and some of that is warranted, right? Rightly so. There's a lot of misinformation and a lot of things that are not true. So, so having a degree of, of skepticism isn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily bad, but when people have skepticism towards, you know, the truth claims of the Bible, um, I always ask the question, like, well, why, why is there skepticism? What's going on there? What's fueling that doubt or that skepticism? And different people have, you know, different, different you know, skepticism for different reasons. You know, I've met people who they have skepticism, like they're skeptical because they've had some kind of bad church experience. Something happened to them in the past, and that kind of framed Christianity for them. They had some bad experience with a person who claimed to be a Christian. It framed Christianity for them. And then they're really skeptical towards Christianity because of what they experienced. And I think we can all say, yeah, we, we understand how that, how that could lead to skepticism. Um, you know, sometimes people are skeptic, skeptic, uh, skeptical because, you know, they, um, they don't really like what, uh, what the consequences of Christianity are. And what I mean by that is they're like, well, you know, like if I believe in this God, then, you know, it says I'm, the Bible says like I'm personally accountable to him and I don't really want to be personally accountable to anyone. And so sometimes skepticism can really be a matter of like, I don't want God uh, to, I don't want to have a God who has authority over me. And so that can actually fuel skepticism. Uh, sometimes, though, maybe it's, you know, somebody heard someone say something that led to skepticism, right? Like maybe somebody heard some, somebody say something like, you know, well, science disagrees with the Bible and it disproves the Bible. And they're like, oh, well, if they said that, then I guess that, that, it, that must be true, right? Which, uh, hint, science doesn't disprove the Bible, just so you know. Uh, but sometimes people can hear things like that and they become skeptical, skeptical. And what I want you to understand is that when we're, when we're thinking about skepticism as it relates to some, a person, right, we, we, have to, we have to understand this is a person, right? This is a person. Like, like, so let's say for a minute that you're a person of faith, right? If you're a person of faith and you have a friend or a family member who's uh, kind of a skeptic, and let's say they're, they're, they're not a person of, of faith, and you see like them really struggling and wrestling with what to do with Christianity, how do you approach that person? Uh, my, my encouragement to you would be, if you, if you know someone who's skeptical, but they're, they're really truly seeking out truth, right? They really want to know the truth, then understand you have an, a great opportunity to be a blessing, a help to that person, to love them, 
to, to walk with them on their faith journey, as they ask questions to try to help them figure out answers to those questions, or at least point them in, in the direction of discovering those questions, to be able to honor them on their faith journey, to be someone who doesn't look down on them for their doubt or their skepticism, but rather says, look, I get it, I understand, I want to help you, I want to be in this with you. Right? And, and I would just encourage you to have that approach whenever you talk to someone who's skeptical. Right? Sometimes, though, you'll encounter someone who's a skeptic, and uh, it doesn't matter how much evidence there is, that person is never going to believe, like, just won't. Like, their heart is hard, and they are just like, you, you just, you're trying to help them, and it's, they're just like, no, and their heart is closed off, their heart is hard. Right? In those kind of situations, uh, we pray a lot. Right? We pray a lot for those people because we love them and we want good for them. And so I, I want to ask you this, right? If you're, if you're someone who's kind of a, a skeptic, right? Maybe you're skeptical. Uh, what kind of skeptic are you? Are you someone who's really, truly seeking truth? Or are you the type of person which it doesn't matter how much evidence you're given, it, it'll never be enough. Because right, if you're really seeking truth, I would say that's wonderful, that's great. And w we want to help you on your journey, right? If you're someone who's saying, it doesn't matter how much evidence you give me, it'll never be enough. My real question then would be, well, why is that? What caused you to become that kind of person? What led to that? Because my guess is that something happened, and I don't know what it is, but something happened, and whatever that is, you probably need to work out that, because, because that is a, it's become a barrier for you, right? You're, you're not able to move beyond that, that. Uh, and because we want good for you, we obviously want you to experience healing, and, and we want that area of your life to, 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 to be resolved in a way that's beneficial for you. You know, as a, as a uh, kind of former hardcore skeptic, um, it, it dawned on me at some point that, you know, like philosophically, logically, skepticism doesn't really work. It doesn't really play out. I don't know if you've ever considered this, right? Like logically, skepticism doesn't really truly work. I'll, I'll illustrate what I'm talking about with a story, okay? There was a, a group of, of college students, and they were having some really deep conversations, and in the group there was a bunch of different people, and there were some atheists, some agnostic people, some people of faith, uh, some people who were just kind of there on the sidelines watching, seeing what's happening, and one of the agnostic uh, students kind of was giving this defense. Basically, uh, you know, uh, he was saying, look, you know, uh, we need to be skeptical of any and all truth claims because you can just never really know, right? You, there's just, you just can't know. There, there's not really enough evidence to know one, th one way or another. So his, you know, his uh, argument was we need to be skeptical. That's really the only logical conclusion because you know, we can't truly know uh, the, the, the truth. And uh, you know, in the group, there were some students who were like, yeah, that's making sense. And then towards the end, there was some Q&A, and one of the students said, uh, can, can, I, can I ask this a, a question? Yeah, you can ask a question. Okay, well, you said we should be skeptical of all truth claims. That's a truth claim. Uh, so does that mean that we should be skeptical of your statement of being skeptical about all truth claims? You get, you get where I'm going with this? Right? That's the philosophical conundrum with skepticism, right? If you are actually a true skeptic, you have to be skeptical of your skepticism. If not, then you're, what are you? I don't know, you're a hypocrite or something like that, right? Like you're not really dedicated to your skepticism. It just logically, it doesn't work. It doesn't play out. And so if you're, skept if you're a skeptic, I would say be skeptical of your skepticism, and, and, and indeed, uh, you know, that somewhat kind of ties into my story. I started out on my faith journey as someone who was really skeptical of, of, of a lot of things. And I started to kind of look in different places like, okay, well, 
Maybe, you know, I wanted to discover truth if truth existed, but I wasn't sure if truth existed. So I started looking in different places and, uh, you know, I dabbled in all kinds of like different things, different religious ideas, philosophical ideas, uh, you know, like Taoism, transcendental meditation, uh, you know, some new age spiritualism stuff, even some occultic stuff. I mean, I was kind of looking everywhere and trying to examine, like, what does this say? What does it mean? Is this true? And as I would, was, was searching in all these different places, I just started to see a lot of faults and a lot of, like, a lot of things that didn't add up. Along that same, that same time in my life, I started to explore Christianity, and I began my Christian, you know, my, my Christian uh, journey I began as a skeptic, like I didn't believe, I wasn't convinced. In fact, I was someone who was like, thought that the whole thing was kind of crazy. And I started to read scripture and as I would read scripture and study and research things, then slowly over time what happened is I started to see evidence and oh well, you know, this is true and then this is true also in history and this connects here and, and, and how could all this be true if this actually wasn't true? And it, like all of a sudden I started to realize that there was a, a lot of evidence that supported the claims of Christianity. And it got to the point to where for me, I was like, you know what? There's more evidence that Jesus is the son of God than there is evidence disproving he's the son of God. And so it came to a point to where uh, it was like, I believed because there was evidence to believe. And that was kind of my journey, starting as a skeptic and ending up being someone, a person of faith who believed the claims of Christ. Um, And so I would just simply say, if you're skeptical, like go on that journey, become an investigator, a detective, try to really search for truth, ask the hard questions, right? Ask those hard questions. Like we're, we're the kind of church that we're not afraid of those hard questions. You can ask any question. And, and if it's a sincere question, we want to sincerely try to help you find an answer for that question. Right? Allow yourself to study, research, be a truth seeker, right? But, but be someone who's actually committed to finding truth. And so what I usually say to people is I say, look, if you search for, I didn't, all I ask is search for truth. And if you search for truth, I'm confident uh, uh, that your search will take you in a particular direction. But I'm not even trying to persuade you in such a way towards saying you have to believe in Jesus. I'm saying search for truth. And I know that if you do search for truth, what will happen? You'll end up believing in Jesus. Because the truth will lead you to Christ. The truth will lead you to Christ. You know, it's been said that um, the genuineness of faith is only as strong as the object of faith. And, and this, is, this is something that I think from time to time we have to Uh, We have to remember. We have to remember. When you think about your faith, there there is a uh, a strength of your faith, but the strength of your faith is not contingent on your strength, but rather the strength of the object of your faith. Does that make sense? So, so for example, like if, if I were to put a chair up here and I would say, here's a chair, stand on the chair. What would you do? You'd look at the chair and you'd, you'd, you'd kind of take an assessment of the chair and you're asking questions. Will this chair hold my weight? That's one of the questions you're asking. And if you think, yeah, I think this chair is strong enough to hold my weight, then what will you do? You'll, you'll stand on the chair. You'll be like, okay, I'm standing on the chair. Because you have confidence. You, have, you're, you see it as something that you believe is strong enough to, to, to stand upon. Well, that's kind of like what the Christian faith is like. Right? We, we, look at, we look at Jesus and we say, is he, is he someone strong enough in which we can stand on him as the foundation of our life? And then, and then we say, well, what's the, what's the evidence that would help us to be able to see his strength? And then we take into account all the different forms of evidence that there is. You see, you see the evidence of scripture. You see scripture prophesying who the Christ would be and what he would do, saying things like where he would be born, how he would live his life, you know, how he would die, all these things. And then Jesus shows up and he fulfills all the prophecies of scripture, with, 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 which is mathematically like almost completely impossible unless he actually is the Christ, right? 
That's evidence. You see even prophecy of Jesus himself saying, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise on the third day. And he's, he's foretelling the future and then it happens according to the way he said it was going to happen. That's evidence. You see Jesus teaching and he teaches the most amazing, wonderful truths there are. You know, things that uh, uh, most people would never even conceive of, like, you know, love your enemies, things like that, right? Most people would never even consider about, consider those types of things. That's evidence, his teaching. You see his character, how he lived his life. He lived a, a sinless life. Uh, that's evidence. You, you see the miracles that Jesus, he, he, he did while on earth, healing the sick, uh, even raising the dead, Jesus doing all kinds of miracles. That's evidence. Then, then you see him do what no one else can, can, can do, and that is defeat death. Right? Evidence. Right? We, we look at, at Jesus and we say, okay, born of a virgin. Only God can do something like that. Lived a sinless life. Only God can do something like that. Died for our sins on the cross. Only God can do something like that. Rose from the grave, defeating death. Only God can do something like that. Uh, then, then transfigured, showing his glory. Only God can do something like that. A ascended in, into the heavens to, to reign as God. Only God can do something like that. We, we look at all the evidence and we say, we say, the evidence helps us to see who Jesus is. And when we look at the evidence, we come to the conclusion, which is the heart of the matter, friends. Jesus is the Son of God. Right? He is the Son of God. Right? John testified he was the Son of God. The Spirit testified that he's the Son of God. The Father testified that he's the Son of God. And the reason is simple, because Jesus is the Son of God. You know, friends, there is going to come a day when you will know for certain Jesus is the Son of God. There, there will come a day when you will stand before Jesus, the day of judgment. And there will not be any doubt. There will not be any question. There will not be any skepticism. There will be none of that, right? Even if, even if you are right now not a believer, understand, on that day, you will know for certain that Jesus is the Son of God. You will stand before him, and as you stand before him, it will be abundantly clear, no question, he is the Son of God. It will happen. It will happen. And, and, and on that day, as you stand before him, as he is enthroned in glory, the Bible says that you will bow, that every knee will bow before him, right? Every knee, we're all gonna bow, right? That every tongue will confess. Every single person is gonna say, you are the Lord Christ, the Son of God. Everyone will say this. So you will witness him being the Son of God. The real question is, are you going to embrace that kind of truth now or wait till then? Because the Bible tells us also that those who reject Jesus in this life will not receive eternal life. That those who reject him now, when they stand before him at judgment, they'll receive eternity without Jesus, which is what we call hell. The reason I say this is because as I was preparing for this message, I was just praying, God, let one person hear this truth and not wait until that day, the day of judgment, but believe today. Let one person see the evidence and say, you know what? I am going to embrace him now. Now, I know for some of you, you're hearing this message and you're a believer and it's a confirmation for you. Hopefully it's reassurance for you. Hopefully you're hearing this and you're saying, yes, he is the son of God. Yes, there's a lot of good evidence and wonderful evidence. Yes, there's reasons why I believe what I believe. And you would be someone who right now, you kneel your knee and you proclaim with your voice, Jesus is the Christ, he is Lord, he is the son of God. Let, let the scriptures as they minister to you today, let them be something that delights your heart in the truth that Jesus is 
not just the Son of God, but He is your Lord and Savior. Right? Let that be a faith builder for you. Let it be something that, 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 that takes you and stirs you up so that you, you can say, Jesus is strong. He is my sure foundation. And I am glad to stand upon him as my rock. Right? That's faith. Not blind faith. That's faith that is built on evidence. That's built on reason. That's, that's built on, 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 on the word of God. And that's what I want for us, is to be a people of faith. Let's pray together. God, we thank you. We thank you for your words. We thank you for ministering to us today. We thank you for just your testimony, testifying that uh, Jesus is the Son of God. And so, Holy Spirit, we thank you for descending upon him to give testimony. Father, we thank you for speaking those words. This is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. We thank you. We thank you also for the testimony of John, how it was written down and it was um, preserved throughout the, the generations so that we can have the sure words, the true words, uh, the testimony of Christ. And so we thank you, God, that you speak truth to us. And I do pray, Lord, um, in our moments of doubt, in our moments of uncertainty, would you speak to us and meet us in those places and reassure us? Even now, if there's somebody who's been struggling with doubt, God, I pray and ask, let this message be uh, something that, that, that ministers to them confidence in Christ. And Lord, I pray for those, uh, the folks who have been, uh, you know, exploring truth. But they, they really, maybe they're skeptical, but they really want to know the truth. I pray, God, uh, would you reveal truth to them? Would you walk with them on their faith journey? Would you help them so that they can know that which is true? Right? Jesus says the truth will set you free. God, set them free so that they can experience the truth of Christ. We pray this all in Jesus' good name. Amen. Well, friends, as we respond, we're going to respond to Jesus.